thanks to all of you once again and uh, and uh, if you don't know me or who has joined after uh, professor konkani has introduced my name is amita badav i am an assistant professor in the department of physics at iim dhanbad and uh, it's uh, it's an honor for me to you know to give uh, the presentation in this webinar series organized by the department and uh, it's a, it's a great great effort and uh, thanks to all of you again so today i'm going to talk about uh, extreme extreme light and its uh, various aspects and particularly i'm going to talk about like two aspects among many uh, which are intense laser plasma and high harmonic generation uh, before i begin just i wanted to share a few like picture to fascinate you uh one would be this uh high energy density science which is possible because of extreme light another is laser fusion science another would be very high energy particle generation by laser wave field acceleration and then finally the high harmonic generation which we call like we can convert one extreme to another now by just showing this few uh, figures let me uh, move to my main content of the talk so here is a brief outline and as per the instruction i have made my slides very brief and crisp and it will be more like a storytelling uh, but i hope at the end of this talk you will get something some take home uh, information uh, after after this uh, talk is done so that's that's my hope let's see how far we can move so i'll begin with extreme light and then it's obvious connection to laser therefore i have to go back to uh, talk a little bit about the laser many of you already know in very great detail and the history of laser development which is still continuing in rapid pace and then i'll come back to the extreme form of this light and its application in modern science and finally the extreme nonlinear science high harmonic generation which is also a door to the atom second world so i'll just give a very brief like maybe one or two slides about this last topic which is of great interest in in uh, the frontier of high intense laser matter interaction research so let me begin with extreme light it's an ultra short laser pulse with very high peak power this slide is particularly for the particularly for the non expert or the students who are not familiar with ultra fast science what do i mean by ultra short laser here in this particular or few particular examples that i am going to talk about uh, is femtosecond laser and let me give you a brief you know perception uh, how short a femtosecond pulse is suppose we have a laser pulse which is extended from earth to moon then the corresponding pulse duration will be of the order of second but imagine that you have the laser pulse which is as short as a human red blood cell then the pulse duration will be of the order of tens of femtosecond that short a femtosecond is compared to a second and then what do i mean by high peak power so if you have enough uh enough sorry am i audible hello yes you are audible doctor okay if we have enough energy inside the pulse which is compressed to this tens of femtosecond pulse duration then the peak power which is defined by the laser energy divided by the pulse duration would be enormous and then this uh this kind of gigantic laser when focused to micron scale the intensities are so high that any material will be instantaneously ionized and it will lead to a high energy density state of matter here i have just given one example 10 to the power 19 watt per centimeter square intensity but you know this area of research is very broad so from 10 to the power 15 watt per centimeter square to even today uh, scientists can achieve 10 to the power 23 watt per centimeter square by the uh, plus laser Uh, in any case let me give you some feel again how intense this intensity 
uh, is. Uh, let us take an example. Suppose we have one is hydrogen electron, and thus calculate the electric field experienced by due to the proton. And that electric field, the simple calculation will give you this 529 volt per centimeter. If we convert this intensity to, sorry, convert this electric field to intensity, the corresponding intensity would be 10 to the 16 watt per centimeter square, like 3.5 10 to the 16 watt per centimeter square. Now this intensity is called atomic intensity. Now any intensity beyond this will be called supercoulombic intensity. And then by interaction of such intense laser with matter creates this high energy density state or, or dense plasma. And these kind of states are typically exist in uh, astrophysical objects like star or core of planet. So we can create star on laboratory tabletop and then study how it behaves. Now let us go back to uh, some fundamentals of laser. Now before we do that, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, or like uh, fascinate you guys how, how uh, the laser is around us everywhere. We are surrounded by laser. Uh, by knowing or unknowingly, we are using laser almost all the time. Le starting from laser pointer to laser printing, optical surgery, optical communication, laser welding, entertainment, remote measurement, and whatnot. Lasers are everywhere, and it's 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 so fascinating. Now, in 1960, 16th May, Mayman first discovered the laser, and then. You know, he said this uh, beautiful phrase that laser is a solution looking for a problem. At that time, it was not even imagined how the laser is being used today and how how the laser has been progressed. We are doing laser cooling. We are we are looking at how the electrons are experiencing uh, the potential in real time, and we are shooting laser to moon to track the moon even. By uh, this brief, like, uh, brief uh, introduction. Professor Adak, Professor Adak, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can you yeah. please uh, hide this? Uh, can you uh, please uh, click what on the hide this? notification on the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you yeah, so thank much you. because thank it you. was it was related to me also. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And then here, radiation is basically radiation of electromagnetic waves. And then, uh, just to give you a brief uh, introduction, laser has this important uh, component, which is called amplifying medium or gain medium. And then a small input signal can be amplified without any other property, like other than the energy. Uh, we'll come detail into it. Before that, let me tell you a little bit of history. So the conceptual building block of the laser was first introduced by Albert Einstein in 1916. He talked about these atomic processes, stimulated emission, absorption, and spontaneous emission. The spontaneous emission is when you have this atomic, uh, this quantum state, excited quantum state, which de-excites, and then you have this incoherent, incoherent and random emission by which this uh, quantum, uh, like this, this system undergoes this de excitation process. So, in terms of the laser, it's it's not uh, very good. Uh, but then soon you will realize that to start a laser or in a laser oscillator, you need different continuous emission to generate a laser. So once the laser is generated, it's a bad thing the continuous emission because we want a coherent emission. But then uh, to start a laser, you need this continuous emission. Anyway, let us not talk about that in detail. Let us come into the stimulated emission and absorption. So these two processes are, processes are basically two opposite processes. So when you have excited state and an incoming photon matching the exact energy level can stimulate another photon by undergoing this 
transition from excited state to uh, the ground state or lower energy state. And the absorption process is exactly opposite, like uh, a photon with energy exactly matching these uh, energy levels can excite uh, the system from the lower energy state to higher energy state by absorbing the photon. Now here in the stimulated emission, the, the coherence is the most important thing which is required for a laser. Like the emitted photon which is, which is induced or stimulated by this incoming photon will have all the features same uh, or will be uh, identical to the incident photon. So this coherent feature is very important for a laser action to happen. But then soon you may ask or realize that, wait, so in a thermal equilibrium, if we see the population or calculate the population, then the lower energy excited state will have much, much more population than the higher energy excited state. And it decays like exponential. So even if you have some stimulated emission, it will be too weak to measure how come a laser action can even be possible. And rightly in 1928, when Rudolf Landberg uh, reported indirect evi uh, evidence of this stimulated emission, that time it was called negative absorption, scientists didn't, didn't simply care because they said it will have little practical importance. But then after World War II, uh, Will Slam and Rutherford, they realized this uh, Population inversion, the concept of population inversion in nuclear magnetic resonance, that is actually the key to have a laser action. And this population inversion can happen in a uh, quantum state or quantum system, but the system will not be in equilibrium. There needs a specific pumping string and, uh, and choice of particular laser medium where we can achieve this population inversion. So without going into detail how this population inversion is achieved, let us assume that you have somehow achieved this population inversion and by a suitable pumping scheme, now you have more population in the upper energy level and uh, by a stimulated emission process, we can generate lots of lots of photons in coherence. In other words, we can generate laser. So this picture is of a laser oscillator where we have this amplifying laser medium or gain medium which will have this quantum energy level state energy level and then pumping process will help to have this population inversion then with a proper feedback optical feedback mechanism by back and forth uh, oscillation of these uh, photons they will like stimulate more and more photons and they keep on increase, increase, increase and the laser action will happen. So the history, uh, the prehistory of this laser is 1953 to 1960. And this is important because like Cowens and his students, they first demonstrated uh, this uh, that time it used to be called like laser or the laser at microwave frequency they first like theoretically uh, predicted and then finally it was shown so in 1964 they got the Nobel prize because of that and then they proposed that this major action can happen in optical frequency also and that time they call it optical measure what we call today at laser and the race to actually build an optical measure began at that time. And finally, Mayman in 1960, uh, he actually achieved this uh, or demonstrated this first optical measure in ruby crystal. Then uh, there are like rich history. I do not want to read everything. And four level lasers came. First CW gas laser was in helium neon. It was in 1.15 micron. Then the the uh, visible one which we use like extensively today it came in 1962 and in the same year uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab they proposed this laser fusion which uh, is uh, is uh, like vision or a dream goal for 
high intense laser scientist then we had this co2 laser and very importantly in 1980s uh, peter moulton demonstrated this titanium sapphire laser for cw version and then the other version and this made, made it possible to have sensitive laser on laboratory table top and uh, in next few years the laser became more and more more and more extremely short like few cycle laser are possible nowadays and those lasers are used in uh, harmonic generation for at a second science now if we see this evolution of laser in terms of power how it uh, evolved over the decades uh, you will see that in 1960 it grows really really fast and then we have a plateau region and this reason of this plateau region was or why the scientists the laser scientists couldn't increase the energy the laser energy or laser power was because simply when we amplify more and more the the laser uh, medium or the gain medium will melt so there is a technological problem but physically uh, it was uh, possible to increase like there was no physical restriction to have more powerful laser finally in 1986 uh, gerard muro and donna strickland they introduced this sharp pulse amplification uh, to the laser community which simply revolutionized this field of or this uh, laser uh, laser the field of laser physics and, sorry hello yeah go hello? ahead go ahead adak okay I, i thought somebody is asking something okay so uh, because of their uh, discovery they actually were awarded nobel prize in 2018 briefly see what is this uh, sharp pulse amplification means which makes it possible to make this laser an extreme light which is the topic of today's talk and this sharp pulse amplification is nothing but you have a short pulse oscillator or a source of a laser which generates this centrifugal laser weak laser like in nanojoule uh, the pulse energy would be order, order of nanojoule and then the idea was to introduce charge or stretch it in time so from tens of femtosecond you can have like hundreds of picosecond by the introducing a charge in the pulse by this pair of gratings and once you have the stretched pulse then the peak power becomes very low like c or r from nanojoule low now we can amplify this laser in this gain medium to extract uh, extract the gain and amplify in terms of energy because because you have now we have the pulse fusion which is much spread so it will not like uh, melt the uh, amplifying medium anymore finally you do a reverse tap or a compressor to compress it back and finally get a very high intense now this extreme high intense femtosecond pulse is uh, is so unique that it can even affect like air or gas medium so in typical experiments uh, this compressor and the experimental chamber all will be in vacuum like almost in temperature bar minus 6 tor kind of pressure and all the optics will be reflective optics because any transmitting optics will Uh, will be damaged now to give you uh, some examples of some extreme light sources i have chosen a few which i have personally used by myself there are like hundreds of systems around the world so two of them were in tata institute of fundamental research mumbai 20 terawatt laser system and then 100 terawatt laser system and then another was in university of colorado boulder which was a kilohertz laser system 20 millijoules per pulse this kind of laser are uh, ideal for high harmonic generation and this kind of lasers are ideal which are like 10 hertz so we have 10 pulse per second but uh, very very high energy uh, compared per pulse compared to this kind of laser these are uh, ideal for high energy design or laser plasma 
so uh, in order to give you some importance of these extreme light sources or some applications among many so i cannot have all of them here one would be high energy density state high energy density science i have briefly mentioned already another will be laser fusion another is high energy density, high energy particle acceleration by laser wake field mechanism ultra fast electron diffraction by which uh, you can track the uh, you know uh, ultra fast structural dynamics of a semiconductor or a solid system high harmonic generation will discuss in a while and so the the area of this research is very very rich and it touches almost all aspect of physics i will mainly discuss briefly this high energy density science on laser plasma and the hdd in my talk as i proceed okay so what is this high energy density science or uh, this extreme laser solid interaction when you have this high intense femtosecond laser pulse interacting with a solid it create a hot dense plasma or high energy density state and what do i mean by hot dense plasma dense by saying dense i mean, i actually mean is a solid density where the electron density would be of the of the order of 10 to the 21 to 23 persist and then by saying hot i mean it's hundreds of electron volt to kilo electron volt millions of kelvin now these kind of states are actually there in astrophysical objects like surface of sun or core of planet so those kind of state of matter is possible to achieve on laboratory tabletop by this intense computer laser solid interaction and this excitation is very rapid and the evolution is ultra fast not only this state is created by this interaction but also it is associated with lots of lots of generation of high energy particles like electrons and ions in fact when uh, this laser solid interaction happens a very high energetic electron current is generated across the sample the solid sample towards the normal of the sample and that creates a gigantic magnetic field and those magnetic magnetic fields could be uh, relevant to astrophysical scenarios again so we have measured uh, this uh, gigantic megawatt magnetic field which are generated by this interaction and its subsequent evolution uh, in laboratory by this cotton modern polarimetry uh, technique this is the ultra fast pump probe technique where basically you shoot a probe at the plasma generated by this uh, powerful laser beam and then the reflected probe will have the the change in the electricity which uh, can be used to, uh, to to extract the information of the magnetic field which is generated in the, at the interaction point. So if like uh, whoever is interested to read more about uh, this process, I will come to have this reference or take a snapshot of this reference. Another example in this high energy density science uh, which I was a part of is this terahertz acoustic generation in hot dense laser plasma and again this terahertz acoustic was generated in this uh, dense plasma after the femtosecond laser is gone so it's not a terahertz acoustic which is directly driven by the laser but the laser produced a hot dense plasma and the subsequent complex hydrodynamics motion of this plasma actually generated this generate this terahertz acoustic and this kind of terahertz acoustics in hot dense plasma was observed for the first time so it was uh, published in uh, in physical review letters again for in order to know detail about this please uh, go through uh, go through this reference so this measurements that i have just talked right now whether it's ultra fast uh, evolution of the giant magnetic field or ultra fast evolution of this uh, plasma or acoustic in the plasma we used ultra fast pump probe measurements now i would like to take a uh, little break and uh, demonstrate uh, this femtosecond pump probe techniques which typically used to capture this sub and dynamics and this next slide would be mainly for the non-expert who are 
not familiar in this science or, or the particular the students so this is a typical setup for a pump probe reflectometry in laser plasma so yeah you don't have to be like uh, very very uh, uh, yeah you don't have to look at all the things here uh, just very simply the laser pulse comes from the uh, laser source from right to left and then you focus this laser by using this off axis parabola to parabola to a solid target a small fraction of the laser is extracted to probe the plasma and that extraction is done by introducing a, a beam splitter here a very thin beam splitter and then uh, by the need of the experiment you can convert this probe to like higher um, uh, harmonics like second harmonic or third harmonic depending on the experiment but let us not go into that just imagine that you have a laser pulse you split the main pulse is focused in the sample and a tiny part is used as a probe and then this probe pulse is passed through a delay stage and this delay stage is made of two things one is a retro reflector it's basically two you can imagine it's as a two mirror where the probe pulse is just reflected back and then this retro reflector mirror is on a computer controlled motorized linear stage so you can move these two mirrors simultaneously in this direction or in this direction okay with micrometer precision and finally you focus the probe beam the plasma and the reflected probe is being measured by rod or spectrometer or a ccd camera even if you want to image the plasma now if we do this setup what happens basically you create a path difference between this between this pump pulse from here to here and the probe pulse from here to here so from the beam splitter to the sample if the path length of this pump is equal to the path length of this probe then the pulse the pump pulse and the probe pulse will come together to the sample and if the probe pulse comes before the pump pulse then we call it a negative delay which can be done by reducing this probe path if the probe pulse comes later or in other words if you increase this probe delay by moving this pair of mirror in upward direction then the probe will come later than the pump we call it a positive positive probe delay now here i have made a very like descriptive animation to uh, demonstrate how this pump probe uh, technique is working so we have this probe which comes first before the pump excites the sample that means the probe will see a cold glass and you have a reflection cold glass reflection but then you move the probe delay or the delay stage and by moving the delay stage as i mentioned in the previous slide here you can match the pump and the you can match the pump and the probe pulse and when you do that the probe will see the hot creation of the hot dense plasma or the plasma mirror and the reflectivity will suddenly increase that means at this delay the pump and probe probe came together and then if you further move the delay stage the probe will come after the plasma is generated so you will see the subsequent evolution of the plasma and each of this sort or each of this experiment is performed at a new spot of this solid sample so that you create identical situation every time when you shoot a laser and then generate this pump probe signal okay so let me come to the next part of my today's talk which is high harmonic generation now high harmonic generation is an extreme nonlinear process 
where an intense laser in uh, micron wavelength is converted to extreme ultraviolet or soft X-ray regime with wavelength of few nanometers to tens of nanometers. Now this process is very, very extremely nonlinear because like tens of photons to hundreds of photons are added together to generate this uh, extreme nonlinear conversion. And typically, uh, this is being done in uh, like in gaseous atoms. Although in like modern day high harmonic generation experiments are being done in solid uh, target also, but I am not going into that field. Uh, that's a uh, that's a very new uh, like few years uh, research field. So let us mostly concentrate on the gaseous atoms, which are very nonlinear driven by a high intense laser, which then generates this UV or soft X-ray laser like beam. And this process is called high harmonic generation process. Now first high harmonic, high harmonic spectrum was uh, found in 1988 by Farrah et al. And the high harmonic spectrum was very interesting and very uh, non-intuitive at the time because you for first few orders of high harmonic you have a sudden like uh, sharp decay in flux but then you have a plateau region where the high harmonic spectrum is near flat and then subsequently uh, we have a sharp cut off and this general feature of this high harmonic spectrum was there for all the uh, all the medium that they perform to it like whether neon gas or spectrum gas and few other gases they have tried uh, so in order to understand this there were various attempts like uh, Kuchib in 1987 and Gallenhauer in 1988 they gave some simple model uh, they proposed atomic antenna and then uh, some, some classical model but finally in 1992 and 93 Kolander et al and Gorkham they presented a quasi classical theory by using these ideas, of course, which reproduce this plateau region of the high harmonic emission. And then their uh, discussion or their uh, calculation, it was evident that in this very high intense laser gas interaction, the electron cannot be treated as a bound particle uh, anymore. Therefore, this regime of this plateau region, or plateau region is actually not belong to the perturbative expansion of polarization regime, which is generally used for describing the uh, harmonic generation process, like second harmonic, third harmonic generation, or fourth harmonic generation that we typically read in nonlinear optics class. This is a completely different regime, and therefore it was considered a discovery. And why this is a completely different regime, or what is the underlying mechanism of this high harmonic generation? So let us see what this Pullender and Korkum, they told about this mechanism. It's a three-step model they have given where uh, this YOLO curve is the electric field of the intense laser. And then you can imagine this is the Coulomb potential. So the electron is ionized by a tunnel ionization mechanism because the intensity is so high. And then when the electron is tunnel ionized, it's, it doesn't escape from that because the strong electric field of the laser is still there. And then the electric field of this intense laser accelerates this electron. And once the electric field is reversed in a laser, as you know, it's an oscillating electric field then the electron comes back and there is a possibility to recombine with the parent ion. And once it recombines, it emits this high harmonic photon, which is the ionization potential of the parent um, atom and the kinetic energy of the return electron. So it's a very simplistic three-step model they have given, which uh, actually can predict this cutoff, uh, cutoff energy and some other feature of this high harmonic generation process, although all the features cannot be described by this because the actual process is very complex quantum mechanical process, which 
can be uh, solved by time dependent Schrodinger equation. But in any case, this uh, semi classical model works really beautifully, as I have mentioned in the previous slide, because the electron, when it's uh, like ionized from the atom in the presence of the strong electric field, it uh, behaves like a free electron wave packet. Therefore, many features are easily like uh, can be achieved from this simple model. Now, high harmonic photons, uh, photon emission occurs at every half cycle of the laser field. That is the like electrons which are generated here, they combine uh, here and electron in the next half cycle which are generated here will be combined in the next half, next half cycle. And it happens uh, uh, in each uh, in each cycle. So basically, at uh, as a result, what you will get flux of HAG burst in each half cycle of the laser burst. And since it's a gas gaseous atoms, like there is no symmetry, like central symmetry, uh, lack of immersion symmetry, we will get only odd harmonics. And uh, a quantum mechanical treatment using strong field approximation was developed shortly after this calculation, which then confirmed the validity of this three step model. Okay, so so far I have this described this high harmonic generation process uh, from atom. And this atomic process is uh, no good for application because the efficiency is very, very weak, like 10 to minus. Of seven, so somehow to in order to use this high harmonic or to produce a high harmonic beam, uh, you need to phase match, like macroscopically phase match uh, the emission from many many atoms, and there are many many mechanisms of this phase matching. One of them that I have also personally used in my postdoctoral research is this um, uh, this gas field hollow waveguide phase matching where the individual emissions are perfectly locked uh, to one another to give this high intense, uh, like bright HAG beam, which then can be used for uh, counter applications. And this, initially this phase matching was not realized or was not thought to be possible because you know the medium is not a uh, crystal. And therefore, like scientists thought, how could you even uh, match the phase velocity of the X-ray and the light beam in, uh, in a gas? But then it was realized that the neutral atoms and the ionized plasma have like opposite dispersion for, for this driving laser pulse, optical laser pulse. And the UV or soft X-ray anyway propagates close to the speed of C. So by tuning the pressure of the gas inside this hollow core uh, fiber, one can actually achieve this phase matching or the phase, uh, the speed of the phase, phase, or the phase velocity of the laser and the UV or soft X ray beam can be matched together to get this uh, nice HAG beam. Now, this HAG beam has a wide range of applications as I have tried to uh, point out in this graph. So here is the characteristic time scale and the characteristic length scale. Uh, it's very like um, natural that when we move a very shorter and shorter length scale, the time scale also become really short. And it's extremely difficult to, uh, uh, to observe all these dynamics in like, uh, for example, the electron motion inside uh, atom or molecule and then molecular vibration or spin dynamic or phonon dynamic. All, all, all these phenomena are happening at ultra short and many times they are happening at nano scale. So HAG beam is an ideal candidate for probing all these uh, phenomena which are uh, happening in, in various field of research. And, it, and uh, this HAG beam is extreme, ex extensively used in order to investigate all these areas of research. So in order to give you a few examples, UV nanometrology is one of them where one can, um, one can extract the acoustic and thermal 
behavior at a nano scale or nano level by ultra diffraction of this UV beam, which is otherwise not possible by uh, optical beam at this uh, small nano scale. We have this X-ray absorption spectroscopy in order to know the element specific, uh, the electronic as well as the structural dynamics inside a material. Then soft X-ray imaging is growing really, really fast and it can dissolve nanometer scale structure but the important thing here is that you can do a time dissolved experiment to know the dynamics of these uh, nanostructures which is not possible by other beautiful mechanism like HCM or AFM because they are like static in nature and then some future applications could be uh, using this high harmonic beam to extract information in warm dense matter and then of course this attosecond uh, science which I'll describe uh, in a brief okay so the potential applications will be in the study of warm dense matter that I have taken for just an example so warm dense matter is at a confluence of plasma solid liquid and gas it's it's uh, it's a state which is uh, very very peculiar because you know, it's not a hot plasma where the Coulomb interaction is negligible than the thermal interaction. It's not a solid where the Coulomb interactions are very important and thermal interactions are just a perturbation, but it's an intermediate state, uh, state where thermal and Coulomb interaction energies are comparable. And therefore, it's very, very difficult to study this one main state which are there in core of planet and, uh, and many other astrophysical objects. And in laboratory tabletop, actually, we can produce this warm dense, warm dense matter and study by this high harmonic beam and in element specific manner. So, by a femtosecond laser, initially you excite the cold electrons. The ions don't know uh, at all what happened because the inertia of the ions make them stick together uh, when this interaction is happening. So. The effect is a very high temperature electron plasma is uh, generated, but the ions are still cold. But in few like picoseconds, then the energy is transferred to the ion, and and then uh, then this this peculiar soup is created, which is one dense matter state where the thermal energy is high, but not so high that you can neglect the flow interest. And the UV, ultra-fast UV or soft X-ray beam can be very useful to, in order to like probe this kind of state on laboratory tabletop. And this will be my like final slide of this, uh, of today's talk. So this high harmonic generation is also a door to the attosecond world. And attosecond pulse are the shortest burst of light ever uh, possible on Earth or on uh, laboratory, and this allow actually probing the dynamics of bound electrons on their natural time scale, which is nanosecond. And this nanosecond pulses therefore can probe this electron dynamics inside atoms or molecules or uh, nanosystems on 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 its own natural time scale, just in order to give. A few examples of this attosecond science, which is uh, which is uh, really growing rapidly, is uh, for example this photoemission delay, where one can measure how this electron, which is generated in this inner tungsten layer, can penetrate this magnesium magnesium layer, and what is, what is the time it, it takes to penetrate one layer of magnesium, or by repeating measurements, uh, even this uh, attosecond science can tell about the orbitals. And then, actually, uh, the scientists in this field they say that you can you can enter the quantum world by this attosecond science, or the quantum world can be now probed by these attosecond pulses. So you can go inside the atom and see how the electron is behaving there. So these are only a few examples and I have uh, given these uh, links uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the
the interstate folks here. And these attosecond pulses are basically possible by this high harmonic generation process. So HHG is a pathway to generate these attosecond pulses. There are various, various techniques by which these attosecond pulses can be generated. I am not mentioning those technical details. There are many optical gating, intensity gating, and uh, like ionization gating, and all sorts of mechanisms and physics needs to be introduced with very tightly controlled um, mechanism to to avoid this temporal dispersion of the pulse, uh, which uh, then enable to to uh, you know compress this HHG beam to at a second or isolated at a second pulse. So with this, I would uh, like to say that you should be stay tuned in this area of research because surprises are continuously coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adak, for uh, finishing the talk uh, in time. Now uh, the floor is open for questions. So those who want to ask questions, uh, you can write the questions in the chat box yeah. or uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Prashant? Manam, sir. No, just uh, you're mentioning about the warm dense matter. Yes. Uh, and as you have said, it is a confluence of uh, three, four uh, states of matter. Right. OK. So my, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> concern is what about its structure? Because as you have sh shown in the slide, the matter the, it has lost its structure when you are create uh, when you are making right. or creating creating a warm density matter. So uh, how do you characterize? Suppose if I have got a solid, I want to convert it into warm dense matter. So then, uh, how, how do you characterize? What is property? How does the properties change? Right, right. So uh, again, it's a re really like evolving uh, field of research, but your question is uh, really valid. So the way scientists or the experimentalists are trying to track is uh, forced to measure its uh, like optical opacity measurement. For example, like how, how uh, uh, a probe beam is getting absorbed in this uh, warm dense state of matter and then try to use some simulation to understand or like molecular dynamic simulation and then other simulation to understand uh, how this material is behaving. But it's a like really ill ill posed problem by itself, as you have said, like uh, <laughs> is, yeah, it, it's, it's a very, very, very challenging problem. But the interesting yeah. thing is why it's important because like 99 percent of the universe is like uh, like a plasma or one dense matter so uh, so it's 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 very exciting but it's very very difficult to 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 characterize uh, by by known method so if we have to have a combination of experiment and the calculation or the simulation like independently we cannot predict the state of the matter so maybe we need to take help from both like use some simulation parameter in the experiment or use some experimental result in the simulation and then uh, club together to understand uh, like what kind of matter it is so yeah so what, what is the range of temperatures uh, within which we can observe this matter say Solids, yeah. so we can, uh, as compared with solids or plasma. Plasma is very high temperature right. state. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, so say, uh, and the solid, you can, uh, you can observe. Uh, I mean, uh, it is uh, stable at say even room temperature also, or even low, below low temperature also, low right. temperature. So at right. what right. temperatures this uh, warm dense matter will be stable? Will it be higher than the temperatures of plasma, or uh, it can be anything uh, in between? Okay. So the temperatures are also in between. Uh, so can you see my slide? Uh, 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 not exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK. Yeah. So typically in the plasma regime uh, is like, again, it's not, there is no hard bound, as you know. But uh, typical, typically, we say, like, if it's more than 10 EV, then it's a plasma region. And 
then uh, like in solid state as you know it's like in the room temperature maybe little higher than room temperature it's like fraction of electron volt but then when we have this intermediate media temperature which is like 0.1 to 10 electron volt uh, that okay. time it's, it's uh, like very tricky situation and nobody you yes. know or like what happens so okay. <laughs> so it's a, like it's a very new and evolving field. yes I, very new field. New, I, wouldn't, i wouldn't say like new in a sense of like people know but like on laboratory table talk it's a, it's a new in terms of the experiment but uh, yeah so Okay. Okay, doctor, uh, there is a question in the chat box. Okay, uh, yeah. Could you, could you please elaborate how this high harmonic generation HHG will bring okay. change in our daily life? Will bring change in our daily life. Okay. So, um, okay. So let me give you like maybe like two example. One is uh, so imagine you have. Uh, this mobile phone today where this lithography technique is making the chip possible and then we are trying to have more and more uh, memory more and more complex uh, electronic uh, devices with more like density of uh, electric line or the lines uh, in in order to hello in order to achieve that as you uh, compress these chips you need a lithography technique which is uh, which is um, called like uv or soft texture lithography and and there uh, this high harmonic beam has lots of application it's it's still in the process but it has lots of application in that and then another is that uh, for example um, the, the intel company intel they were collaborating with uh, my postdoctoral research when i was doing they wanted to know how these like nano films behave in terms of its thermal and acoustic response and then high harmonic generation and its application in this nano field actually can tell lots of property about this nano film which are directly used in industry so in terms of like direct direct applications you have many but it has in parallel lots of lots of application fundamental science also. and fundamental science one day will translate to uh, the industry so uh, and and affect our daily life and in terms of fundamental science we we, we can uh, understand how uh, electron behaves inside uh, atom or molecule let's say biologically relevant molecule how the tra- charge migration happens and by at a second science and harmonic generation scientists are able to understand uh, or answer those questions so i mean it's countless i can like keep on giving examples which have this application in fundamental and and, and technology so uh, but uh, like uh, if if uh, yeah if you want to know more i can give lots of links and references so please drop me email in case uh, you want to know more so Yeah. Yeah, Professor Adak, I have uh, one uh, questions uh, which I'm very curious. Oh yeah, uh, please. Yeah, because you are us- using very extremely high energy lasers, right? So uh, and oh, now uh, yeah. in terms oh, of the plug my treatment. Yes. Yes. And in terms of like the real applications, you know, for example, if you want to go for uh, X-ray lithography or X-ray lithography, and then like even you want to detect these those kind of lasers, you now you may need the detectors, right? so even if like uh, for instance like even if we are going with uv detectors they are very costly also so since you are going working with a very extremely very high power laser the detectors the optical lenses everything whatever is required in your experiment are they commercially available or are you customized i mean you are making yourself or how do do they and then of course the cost may be very costly and then the corresponding you know end product of the devices should be again very highly expensive uh, so can you just come in on that yeah yeah definitely so the uv beam uh, that is generated those are not like not powerful at all compared to the laser that actually we are using so the uv applications can be like uh, low power optics but still uh, this uv and nanometer scale optics can be very very costly although they are available uh, like 
on market and then uh, regarding this high power laser so uh, whenever we use this uh, high energy uh, like dielectric mirror or let's say grating etc you have to have a really expanded beam the powerful the laser is you have to expand the beam more because you know there is a like power threshold of all this optic but then uh, to answer your question uh, like there are companies who routinely make this high power laser optics so they are like available uh, they are available um, like in terms of commercial availability and but the thing is like you cannot believe uh, the optics blindly so every time we have a optics in the lab you have to really characterize and see uh, what it's behaving in the femtosecond regime because the companies they will not tell like uh, this power at femtosecond how the optics will be behaving they will say about some average power okay, okay. so uh, every time you buy but they are, but these are available optics so you buy a optics high power optics they typically quote the average power density for the optics maybe in picosecond or nanosecond time scale but for your laser you have to like you have to be careful and maybe slowly ramp up the power uh, so yeah. how about the cost uh, the, the cost of those components i just wanted to know a little bit on it the cost of the components like the detectors the uh, the de detectors means the ccd and all because yes, yes. I mean, the components that the, the, what are the, the price it is very expensive or is like reasonable see the uh, i think it's reasonable okay yeah is reasonable unless, unless you do uh, like very uh, specific uh, wavelength range kind of thing for, for example this titanium sapphire laser optics which are at 800 nanometer wavelength at center they are very standard so okay. you can get in reasonable price like in india you can so for example uh, like at tfr we used to do this high power laser experiment but yeah i mean we could we could get them like cheaply also okay okay thank you and this is very specific it will be fine okay thank you yeah okay uh, dr adak there is another question yeah uh, is it possible to produce high harmonic generation by any non linear material by any non linear mechanism no mr nitesh kumar no this is not possible uh, high harmonic generation is uh, in fact a extreme non linear process so there is no way you can generate high harmonic like generate high harmonic by non linear mechanism you need intense light you need extreme non you need to drive the electron extreme non linearly uh, in the atoms and then then the high harmonic will be produced yeah okay so if there is any, any other question please uh, yeah please ask up. and and like uh, the students are encouraged to ask questions because right. they typically get shy and uh, and if you if you are not able to frame the question right now if uh, yeah. if you find the question yeah, later animal, yes. you can write you can write to, to dr adak yeah definitely right. definitely i'll be happy to like discuss and give references and answers right. whatever way i can so dr prashant would you like to ask something prashant is not there uh, i think no sir it's okay okay so with this i think uh, we come to the end of this uh, session so i would like to thank dr adak for his uh, very clear and uh, actually i i found it very interesting because he started with uh, the whole history and development of the laser and then he came out to a very technical uh, uh, subject which was, which he presented very nicely this so thank, thank you dr adak thank thank you very much and thanks to all who joined uh someone asked that uh, we will get any certificate for attending this session no this is an informal uh, uh, webinar we are not providing any certificate okay we will think that in future we will if you organize any webinar then we will uh, try to provide the certificates also with Last exam also with with uh, exam with exam, with exam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and lots of people are asking for uh, the feedback link uh, no